meet one of those songs along the way. That was the song. And that's been keeping me for a few weeks. My husband is getting a bit fed up with it, I think, but he, he loves the game time. But uh, I just want you to, to pray for us. Um, Jason hasn't been very well. Normally he sings a, a song about like crying at this slot, but this morning um, he's, he's just sitting back. Um, thank you once again for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be making this known, and I felt the need to say as well that um, I don't know if your pastor told you how we met, but um, I actually met your pastor when well, I was working at West Indies College, and we ended up doing some singing together. And um, here we are in England, how many years going? I'm just going to ask you to go back to the, to the um, slide with the last papers on there. You've got that one in there. I'll start in the meantime, Las Vegas. Las Vegas, a city famous for casinos and hotels. And it has more than 40 million visitors most years. And the same number of individuals that visit will never leave because a number of them will be found dead in their hotel rooms, most of them of natural causes. According to the Clark County Coroner's Office, about 110, 1,000, sorry, 100 visitors die while in Las Vegas each year. And the coroner's office says that 67% of those deaths are the results of accidents, 15% committed suicide, and 11% were the victims of homicide. No cause of death could be determined in 6% of the deaths. Can you go back to the picture? Thank you. People are dying. <coughs> People are dying from a lack of love, hope, and knowledge. As believers, we are also affected. But only if we would check into Sathir, we would find everything that we are looking for. And despite the ongoing trials, we would live a life of purpose, victory, and hope. And all will unfold as we pray. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we give you thanks and praise once again for this moment. I have nothing to say, you have everything to say as the sister says, and I'm asking Lord that not I will be seen, but all of Christ will be seen, and you know what you have chosen to say to some hurting individuals this morning. I pray that you will be with us all. I pray that your Holy Spirit will fill our hearts in this place, and I pray that we will be attuned and will be changed by your message. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. It's really hot in here as well, um, deacons trying to get some air in. Cause me no matter what nobody else keep on this. So if I see you getting a bit, you know, I will be asking for them to be really open up the windows. So um, this morning, the title you can go back to that is from Heartbreak Hotel to Sophia, and that's a strange word, but you will understand a bit more as we go along. In preparing this sermon, I also learnt that. Three famous singers actually sang a song about Heartbreak Hotel. Can anybody tell me? Whitney Houston. Who? Whitney Houston. Elvis Presley. Whitney Houston. Whitney Houston. Yeah, Michael Jackson. And Elvis's sang, um, song went, Well, since my baby left me, I found a new place to dwell down at the end of Lonely Street at Heartbreak Hotel. Well, I get so lonely, baby, I get so lonely, I get so lonely, I could die. Although there is, it's crowded, you can always find some room. Whitney Houston, this is the Heartbreak Hotel. You said you'd be here by nine, instead you took your time. You didn't think to call me, boy. Here I sit, trying not to cry, asking myself why you do this to me. Since you're not around for me to tell you, baby, face to face, I'm writing you this letter, and this is what I have to say. All I really wanted was some of your time. Instead, you told me lies when someone else was on your mind. What you do to me, look what you did to me. I thought you were someone who would do me right. Michael Jackson. 
This is Heartbreak Hotel. Welcome to Heartbreak Hotel. Hope is dead. She thought that I cheated for another lover. I turned my back to see that I'm undercover. Now I can't convince this girl there ain't no other. Someone's evil to hurt my soul. Every smile's a trial. Thought in beguile to hurt me. This is scaring me. Then the man next door had told me she'd been in tears for 15 years. This is scaring me. We came to this place where the vicious dwell and found that wicked women run this strange hotel. There was Sephra and Sue, every girl I knew, and my baby said, love is through. Looking at these lyrics, I don't know if you can spot the common theme. It seemed like Heartbreak Hotel was a place that one checked into after experiencing great disappointment. And especially for those who are in love affairs that turn sour. There seemed to be no happiness there. It seems to be where the hurt victim reflected and was finished pain, letdowns, heavy despair, hopelessness, and suicidal thoughts. It seemed to be a place, it seems to be a place where one goes when they think that they have come to the end of hope. And so I was asking Jason why he thought that so many people headed towards Vegas to kill themselves. And he said that because Las Vegas is a place that is filled with a lot of casinos. Perhaps people went there because they thought it was the last chance that they had to probably put their last amount of money in the casinos and gamble and be able to win some money and turn things around in their lives. And then it seemed like when this didn't go right, then they would do something in their hotel room and then they would be found dead. And um, later on, and this also included a lot of celebrities, apparently. But what's wrong with this picture? What's wrong is that they didn't need to travel so far to resurrect changes in their lives. Because there is a place I want to talk to you about that is opposite to Heartbreak Hotel. And this place is much closer. And by checking into it, despairing folks can have their hurts and their disappointments overturned. And this morning I introduce to you the place, Sethir. And if we can get that up on the screen, then people will be able to make sense of the word. There it is. If we look at Psalm 91, verse 1, it says that he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide where? Under the shadow of the Almighty. And in my research one morning, these words caught my attention in the secret place. So I went to my little Strong's reference, and the number, as it says on there, is H5643. And it appears after the phrase in my Bible. And it means it's a place of covering. It's where one can hide themselves. It's a place of refuge or a place where someone can be hidden. And this Hebrew word, which is sefer, can be found 36 times in the Bible. And wherever it is found, it refers to a secret place, covering and protection. It also refers to being hidden from slanderous tongues. But this place is also synonymous with another place, as we see in Psalm 91, verse, verse 1. And this place is synonymous with the shadow of the Almighty. And the shadow means the shade or a place of defense. And the difference is when you check into Heartbreak Hotel, you have a manager, don't you? Or you have a, a hotel receptionist and the only motive for welcoming you into this hotel is that they know that you're gonna pay them some money. But checking in into Sathya, it puts you into the presence of the Almighty himself. It puts you into the presence of the almighty, the monarch of the universe, who is our creator, he is our sustainer, our provider, our redeemer, our deliverer. At times he's been our lawyer, he's been our doctor, he's been our counselor, he's been our benefactor, he's been our beloved, breasted one, the El Shaddai. 
And I heard Pastor referring to that, that sometimes God is seen in a feminine position. And this word, the breasted one, talks about having a breast. That is the El Shaddai, another name for our God. And our God performs wonders that cannot be fathomed and miracles that cannot be counted. His power is unlimited and he has more than a thousand and one ways to bless us and to turn things around in our lives. You see, when people make that trek across to Las Vegas from wherever they are, they check into a hotel due to despair and trials. They don't just get up and do it, they think about it, they plan it because they need money, don't they? They need a ticket if they're living out of state to get there. And in the same way, I believe as believers, we shouldn't wait for the crisis to hit. But we should consistently be thinking ahead of how we can dwell in the secret place of the Most High. We can't just dip in and out of God's presence during the hard times and live elsewhere during the good times. A relationship with God should not be had only at our convenience. Unless we're developing that relationship with God on a daily basis, we will end up at Heartbreak Hotel when one bill comes in after the other and we are financially frazzled. We will perhaps think of checking into Heartbreak Hotel when our spouse walks away or cheats on us or when our lovers who professed his undying love or her undying love disappears or when sickness comes and the pain is debilitating. It may be the emotional trauma that's sucking every inch of life from us. Perhaps someone we love dearly has passed and our world is upside down and we can't see because the tears are dimming our eyes. It may be not just that, but perhaps we are caught in a repeated cycle of sin Something that we've been struggling to get loose of for all these years and we can't get loose of it and we feel like if we are exposed then we might as well check in to Heartbreak Hotel. Well whatever it is that's overwhelming your faith and threatening to take you out this morning, you need to know that you can find cover, you can find protection, you can get defense under his wings. Amen. We're not serving a God who is out of touch with our infirmities. He is aware of all our trials, the hurt, the disappointments, the letdown. He knows that we are frail. He knows that we cannot help ourselves, but he won't force himself upon us. If we have a problem, we have to go to him. We have to call out to him even when we do not have a problem. We should cry out to him. Some of us would prefer to die rather than to cry out to him. And I think that's because we do not understand the power of this God that we are serving. I love David's description of him. In Psalm 103, I absolutely love that chapter in the Bible. Verses 3 to 14. And David describes him as a God who forgives all our iniquities. He heals all our diseases, redeems us from destruction, crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies, executes righteousness and judgment for the oppressed. He is merciful and gracious and long-suffering, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always treat us as we deserve, neither will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor reward us accordingly. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, he removes our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities all of those who trust in him. For he knows and he remembers that, guess what? They are just dust. Amen. You know, even now, I believe that someone came here this morning and they were heavy. And they were probably thinking of checking into Heartbreak Hotel. You might not have known that that was the title of where you were planning to check in. Because this problem that you have is consuming you. It's consuming your mind. It's choking out the voice of hope. And you can't think straight. You're feeling like there's no escape. And this thing is just breaking your heart. But I'm here 
to tell you this morning that your greatest enemy, the deceiver, the traducer, that liar, is the one who's trying to separate you from the presence of your loving father. And you must not believe the lies. Amen. If we are going to be believing the lies of the enemy at this point, when we are pushed forward into the time of trouble, we will not stand a chance. We have to learn to trust God now in the not so bad times. Because when those times come, as they will, we won't be established upon the rock. The Bible says that because Satan knows that his time is short, he's going around as a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. You need to tell Satan, I am not on your menu, Satan. Get thee behind me. You know, we read many strange stories in the Bible and... I read this one, Judah and Tamar, and I want you to go home and read it for yourself. And it was after reading this one morning that I, I got this sermon title. And I don't know if you realize, but there were three Tamars in the Bible. Did you realize that? And two of the Tamars, they had some tragical experiences. And so I'm going to talk about one of them. And, and Genesis 38 records, I'm just going to do a summary of it. That Jacob's son, Judah, who was, you know, one of the 12 tribes, he had three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. A woman named Tamar married Ur, who died, leaving her a widow, since it was required that the next of kin should care for a brother's widow. Tamar was then given to Onan, the other brother, but he also died. And then Shayla, the third brother, he was still a boy and he couldn't marry Tamar. So Judah, which is Tamar's fourth father-in-law, asked her to go back home to her father's house and wait until Shayla was grown up. However, once Shayla was old enough, Judah did not honor his promise. Tamar remained an unmarried widow, and you know what it was like in those days. And so Tamar then came up with a plan to secure her own future. And I believe that Tamar must have thought about this and felt that she was really desperate and this was my last resort. And she didn't want to leave the world without having a seed to prolong her generation. And so she checked into Heartbreak Hotel, I think, and she did this by going into town disguised as a prostitute. And she tricked Judah, this was the father-in-law, and got him to sleep with her. And I can only imagine that Tamar must have felt awful because Tamar was actually risking being stoned to death if she was found out. And so it's as if she was in Heartbreak Hotel gambling her chances. So then she became pregnant by Judah and she bore twin sons named Perez and Zerah. But thank God her story didn't end there because out of the lineage of one of her twins referred to as Perez in Matthew 1, 1 to 3 came Jesus Christ the Messiah. Amen. And I thank God that because of his merciful, gracious nature he often looks beyond our faults and he sees our needs and despite our sinful behavior he's willing to step into our mess and he's willing to forgive us and to cleanse us up and then he turns our mess into a message a life saving message and then he takes us from being victims to being victor and also when we're going through trials he makes us triumphant in our test so i'm saying to somebody this morning i don't know who you are but the message is please do not write yourself off by checking out of god's presence i want you this morning to run into his presence even if you don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit takes our moanings and our groanings up to the Father in heaven. And his ears are always open to our cries. And I want you to ask him and say, Father God, roll away the reproach. Roll away the shame. Roll away the disgrace from me this morning. And wrestle with him for your breakthrough, church. Amen. 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 
this morning, this week, I, I was saying to Jason, I don't know, but there's a lot of hurt in the church. Mm. People are hurting. Mm. And thank you that it's Women's Day, because I didn't even quite get that. But you know, women, we tend to be more, a bit more in touch with our feelings. Mm. A lot of people are hurting. Mm. I was saying to Jason, I don't know what I'm going to preach this morning, but I know that people are hurting. And people are doing a good job by dressing up and coming out. And how are you? I'm fine. And you don't want to put on that smile. But deep down inside, you're about to combust. And you have to hold it down. Because of church. Well, you know what? And God has said this to me in my situation. That unless we get sorted... That's why we can't receive the gospel as we ought to. Because we are hurting. Some of us are so full of hurts and challenges and we are heartbroken. And we are trying to receive this. We are trying to receive that God is love. And in our hearts we are saying, is you really love? Because if he didn't love me, how comes he allowed me to go through this? And how did he allow me to go through that? And I want to say to somebody this morning that I too was at that place. I've been there. And I just want you to know that God, he does love you. Yeah. That he does have a plan for you. Yeah. And that plan will still come to fruition. Yeah. But you have to stand on the rock. Yeah. You can't go to your friend. You can't go to your lover. You can't go to the pastor. You can't go to the elder or the deacon or your children. You have to run into the secret place. Because that's where you will meet the almighty God And he alone has that power That you need to turn your life around What are you chatting about Shirley Dress up looking all prim and proper I will share a testimony with you later But it's time I think folks For us to get real And get real with God Young people You're no different God love our young people in love for the And I know sometimes when you're there, you're thinking, what are you talking about? You don't love me. Look what's happening to me. But he loves you. And from personal experience, this is what I want to say to you this morning. Do not give up on God. It doesn't matter what it looks like now. Because I know there were times when I was going to church in my teens. And I know that people thought I was a rebel. Because sometimes you're going through your stuff. And you can't articulate that stuff to anybody. You just adapt church culture. And you go into church and everybody says, How are you? I'm alright. But that time, yeah, I did. <laughs> and then there were other times I would go into church and my eyes would be all blue and the makeup would be thick. And you know that sometimes those who don't understand or those who pretend they don't understand, they'll be like, just talking again. Look on eye. But then I had a friend. And my friend who understood me, she used to say, Shirley, what's wrong? What's happened? Because sometimes people don't see, they don't understand that it's a cry for help. But I just want to encourage you as young people. Pastor, don't throw me out this morning. But I want to say, however you need to come into the sanctuary, come. I'm not saying that you're supposed to dress any and anyhow, no. But I'm saying you will get there in time. Do you know what I'm saying, adults? Because sometimes we want them to come how we want to see That's them. Right. But it's a journey. That's right. I went to church one day because I was fed up. I had an argument with God. And nobody saw the argument. But I don't tell him, you see me, me and you, we done. Church finished. I spent my last youth day in church. And so when somebody came and God sent this woman to preach. And the woman preached a sermon. And when she preached a sermon... I looked and I listened and I said to God, you know what? You don't lose me already, too late. I've said it, this is my last Sabbath in church. And after this, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to go out and sing my reggae song then and wear what I want. And so this young lady, when she finished preaching, I went up to her and I said, it's too late. Thank you for the message from him. But tell him it's too late because I don't tell him I'm leaving. So once Shirley says her word, she's going to live by it. This is me all puffed up, full of myself, yeah? And I'm not coming back to church. 
and she invited me to her church. And when I went to church, I said, yeah, I'm not messing about with you, Lord. I'm done with you. I looked in my wardrobe, I found the shortest suit. The shortest suit. And I went to church. I was vexed. Because when I went to church, she invited us to her house. And she invited all these lovely young Christians who were so sure of their God. And when they started testifying how good God was, I got up and excused myself from the dinner table. Because I said to them, he ain't that good to me, man. And I walked off. You know, sometimes you're going through. You're going through. And I was in church doing praise and worship, some service. But people just don't know. I came to Heartbreak Hotel that Friday night. And that's why the Sabbath, I was like, that's the last youth day. And I said to God, I'm leaving. I'm fed up. And the, the next Sabbath, I went into sh I went shopping. And I wanted people from church to see me. Nobody knows see me, I don't know. <laughs> I never, ever wore a pair of jeans. I went into the shop on the Sabbath. I bought myself a pair of jeans. I came out in the jeans. And I'm walking, stush. And I'm saying, is there no church people to see me? And the Lord just hid everybody. <laughs> Why? Because the Lord knew that even though I said I'd left church, the week after I was back in church, I never left since. <laughs> okay. Sometimes it gets hot. Sometimes it's so painful. Sometimes it's so harsh and you can't see the way. You're thinking, how am I going to get out of this? I can't cope. Lord, what am I to do? And so you realize you're having a meltdown. You're breaking down. And all God is saying is just call me. Step into my presence. Step into Sathir. He who abides under the secret of the Almighty. And in the shadow, I will defend you. I will protect you. But sometimes we still have to go through the fire. Yes. Where we feel that we are not being protected. But God is watching and he's yes. there. Yes. And he won't allow us to be burnt in that crucible. And I thank God for my experiences because I would not be able to give you a word this morning, young people. I just want you to keep going. We look at the life of David. And David could have checked in, couldn't he? into Heartbreak Hotel. David, whose eyes got him in trouble, instead of keeping his eyes on Jesus, he had his eyes on somebody else's wife, who was baby. And because of that, that led him to murder Uriah, her husband. And then she got pregnant. And then the baby died. And so, um, David himself could have chosen to step into Heartbreak Hotel. But you know what the Bible said that David did? David actually decided that he's going to cross over into Sephir. David went before the Lord and repented of his sins. We need to take a lesson from that. We need to humble ourselves sometimes, most times. We need to humble ourselves and go back to God. Yeah. You know, there was I carrying on with myself. I'm vexed with you, God, and you haven't done this and you haven't done that. But eventually I had to humble myself because you know what? His ways and his thoughts are much higher yeah, than mine. And I might not understand today, but what God was saying is that I want to raise you up to be a speaker to encourage others. So that when you talk, you're not just talking book, but you know what it is like to sleep on somebody's floor for a year. You know what it's like to go hungry. You know what it's like to almost check into Heartbreak Hotel. And you also know what it's like to step across into Sathir, into the presence of the Almighty. Solomon 1 verse 4, draw me, we will run after thee. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. You know, Solomon was so hot, wasn't he? And so was the wife, the Shulamite wife. It's because you told you had lyrics. No, sir, you don't have lyrics. Because when you read this fiery 
every exchange that's going on. You see some heat from the Shulamite wife and Solomon talking about love. And so, when you look at that, I just want to say that when I read Solomon again recently, I realized that Solomon typifies our Christ, our bridegroom. Because in the Bible, a woman typifies the church. And I just want to say that this Shulamite woman, she was so confident of this love of her husband. She had pleasure rendezvousing in the presence, in their privy chambers, because she knew how much she was loved by her husband. And, you know, as it would go with human beings, Solomon later acquired 700 wives. Look how he was talking to this beloved wife. <coughs> and that's man for you. Man, we will always fail. But let me tell you, I didn't mean just man, male. I mean humankind. We will fail. We will say things and we will make oaths and promises. And then we can't back it up. You know, because he loved this woman so much. And yet after that, he acquired so many hundreds of wives. And I say that to say this. You say when we look at Jesus now, Jesus is a different kind of husband. Jesus, our bridegroom, his words never fail. Jesus will never lie. His love for us remains. And I want to say to you today, I don't know what you're going through. And when you look, you know, you might be thinking, I need to hear something. Because as women, you know, talking about Women's Day, we are motivated by our verbal seductions, aren't we? We like to hear nice things. You know, sometimes you're walking out on the street, somebody, what's the way you look nice? The grin just widens up, doesn't it? I know sometimes it depends on who. But, you know, sometimes you're just going along your merry way and it just comes out of somewhere unexpectedly and it just brings a warmth to you. You know, when you look at young lovers, have you seen young lovers? You know, you was in love once, don't you? Yes? Are you not going to admit it? Yes. And you know, when sometimes when you're with that person, and this is the giddy kind of love when you're young, and you're with that person and the person is whispering, nobody else is privy to the conversation, just you and that person, and people are looking and all they're seeing is you going, <laughs> You know, women, come on, don't look at me like that. You know what I'm talking about. So the men don't behave like that. So you know, you're in that place. And you're, you know, I don't know what to say to you. But we call them sweet nothings. Yeah? But it makes you feel good, doesn't it? It boosts your Man, there's a little bit of tip. Yeah? There's a tip. So, you know, just, you know, pour around the audible. Yes? But make sure it makes sense if you're a big man. Because it won't be received the same way now. Yes? So... These, I call them verbal seductions. Mm. But somebody might be here this morning and say, well, I'm single and I don't, I don't have that. Where do I get that from? But after, even if you're married this morning, I want to say, we have a greater lover. Mm. We have a greater mm. lyric, lyrics are. Yeah. You know, in Jamaica we say lyrics are. Mm. We have somebody who is a lyrics are. Mm. And let me share with you what he's saying today. He's saying... Don't let Satan seduce you any longer. Put away the alcohol, whatever you're using to, to, to soothe yourself. Put away the drugs and the cigarette and the illicit lifestyle. He said, stop performing those rituals that's entangling you further into sin. He said, abandon those vulgar and lewd conducts that will widen the separation between us. He says, come, come let us reason together. He says, though your sins be as scarlet, it shall be white as snow. And he continues, he said, come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he's whispering, you are of God, my child, and you have overcome them because greater is me in you than he that is in the world. And he's saying, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with you wherever you will go. And he says, I know the enemy is shouting loudly to confuse you and to displace you, but you're not going to die in your shame and disgrace. He said to you, you shall not 
die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Amen. There are times when I have to say these things over myself. We had swine flu once, and the same thing, I thought I was going to die. I picked up the Bible and I couldn't read. I was all confused. And my husband this week said the same thing with his sickness. But we shall not die. But we will live and declare the works of the Lord. Amen. Satan is trying to say to you, this is it. You've messed up now. One too many. God is not going to forgive you. And God says, if you confess your sins, I am faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And then he says, my mercies are new every morning. Don't forget, so every morning when you wake up, I'm adding new mercies to your account. And the enemy is taunting you and he says, just take a shot to numb the pain. And Jesus said, I have already taken those shots, so you don't have to. That was when I was wounded for your transgressions. I was bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement of your peace was upon me. And by my stripes, you are healed. The enemy smirks and he says, I know I understand. No one has ever had to endure this pain that you're feeling. And it's impossible to overcome. So give up now. And then Jesus looks at you and he says, my child, there has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you're able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape so that you will be able to bear it. Said, don't forget, I have loved you with sweetness with an everlasting love. Amen. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. He said, since thou was precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable and I love thee. Therefore, will I give men in exchange for you. Fear not, for I am with you. He said, I've given you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and all power of the, of the enemy. And we don't believe these things. We don't understand these things. We don't understand that God has given us authority. And we need to search the word. We need to pray. We need to ask him to show us what it means. He heals the broken in heart. He's standing knocking at the door. I am the Lord that healeth thee. He says, I know the plans and the thoughts I have for you. Plans for peace and well-being and not for disaster. To give you future and a hope. He says, without faith, you need faith. It's impossible to please me. And now you are clean through these words that I've spoken over you. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't know who you are. But you're not destined to die at heartbreak hotel. You're not destined to die there. Go over into Sathir. Because he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will remain secure and rest in the shadow of the Almighty. We have to say he's our refuge and our fortress, my God, in whom I trust, for he will save us from the trap of the foe. And I'm going to ask you when you go home to read Psalm 91 again, as I'm going to share a testimony. Whatever is going on, God wants you to know that you don't have to die. Yeah. When I look at individuals, people are dying, yeah. losing the faith, leaving the church, okay. leaving God. Our churches are becoming emptier. Oh. We need to connect and stay connected. Amen. I want to let you know the reason why I qualify to talk about from Heartbreak Hotel to Sathir is that I remember one night many many years ago I myself had checked into Heartbreak Hotel and I'm just wondering has anybody ever been there I remember lying there in my bed shedding tears as I reflected on my current state of play I was exhausted from being wrapped up and tied up and tangled up, not in Jesus, but in sin. I felt hopeless. I felt helpless. I felt despairing. I was wondering, when will change come? I grappled with God because I'm thinking, I've heard so many testimonies that God is able. And I'm thinking, well, where are you now then? How comes you're not able to take me out of this thing, out of this mess? And so I lay there silently groaning in 
my spirit with the tears running down my face. And as I lay there, the spirit of the Lord, I can only say now, came and he told me to reach across onto my bed, as we would say. And right there, I had the Bible. And even though I'd been crying and my eyes was just clouded with tears and I couldn't see because the pain of disappointment was pressing upon my mind, my distress spirit cried out unto the Lord and I knew I couldn't express myself verbally, but I was desperate for a life-changing word. And so, being so broken, I opened the Bible and it opened to Psalm 91. Amen. And I was scanning the page, you know, when you're just reading, because remember there's tears and it's all blurry and I'm in a state. And I just wanted to hear something. I needed some sweetness. I needed a love note. Do you understand what I'm saying? I needed something to give me hope in that situation and I started reading he that dwelleth in the secret place and as wonderful as that is now that didn't reach me and I was reading again I will say of the Lord he is my refuge and as I read that that didn't reach me and surely he will deliver me from the snare of the fowler and that didn't reach me because I didn't understand what he's talking about and he said he shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings and I'm thinking well I don't still know what you're talking about and so my eyes started going down the page because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. I don't know what you're talking about. And then, uh, Amen. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. I got to verse 14. Yes. Mm. And I love it until this day. I got to verse 14. And in my desperate state, this is how I read it. And this is how we need to be reading and claiming the promises of God. Especially when we're in a situation, put your name in there. He's talking to you. We need to take the words off the page now. We're living in the last days. Let us stop reading the words as if he's talking to somebody else. Yeah, David wrote that then. No, make it applicable to us and it will free us. Amen. It said, because... You, this is my lover now, this is my God. Because you surely have set your love upon me. Remember I tell you I was in a state, I wasn't in a good place. I wasn't in church all dressed up on the pulpit. I wasn't singing a holy song. I was not in a good place. I was in my mess. But he said, because you have set your love upon me, my heavenly father talking, therefore surely I'm going to deliver you. Amen. Yeah. I don't want to let you throw me out, you know, but I felt like doing a little spin. Yes. That's <laughs> That's a nice because sometimes, you know, when you have the experience, and, and then when you're going, let me spin and spin. <laughs> and you're going through it, and it just makes sense, and you're thinking, Lord. Uh, he said, I will deliver you, I will set you on high. I was in the dog pit, dirt. Mark, I was in a mess. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. So if you're in a mess today, please don't let Satan lie to you. In my liar, uh, that's what his name means, liar deceiver. Uh, so he lies. He's telling you, you will never get out. You're, you're gonna die in this mess. Rebuke it in the name of Jesus. And the father in it. Rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Satan said it, but God said he will give us power to crush him under our feet. Yeah. Sometimes you have to carry on a bit crazy, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yes. Yes. Because this stushness ain't gonna work. Yes. Yes. I will set you on high because you've known my name. You surely shall call upon me. You, you look a piece of dirt, dust. Charlie, you should call upon me and guess what? I'm not gonna ignore you. I will answer you. And he did. I will be with you in trouble, Shirley. Yeah. I will deliver you and honor you yeah. with long life. Yeah. Because when you're in a mess, Satan, don't tell you you're gonna dead in here. Mm. You, you're never getting out. And then God counteracted that and said, with long life will I satisfy you and show you my salvation. Amen. I'm saying to somebody this morning, it doesn't matter how low you are. It doesn't matter how deep that situation.
situation is. It doesn't matter how entrenched. It doesn't matter how dark the situation. I'm a living testimony that you can never be too far from the presence of Amen. our God. Amen. Amen. I'm going to wrap up. But I'm also going to speak. Young people. I'm picking on you. I love young people, you know. I love everybody. But I love young people. Because sometimes I felt when I was growing up, we didn't get enough attention in church. We did a why, but nobody spoke to us specifically. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and all I wanted to say to you is that you all have a path. You have a calling. God has a calling upon each and every single one of your lives. But it's not going to be easy getting there. So what Satan is going to do, he's going to allow situations to happen, to come to you. But all you need to remember is that if God is allowing you to go through it, go to it, he's going to take you through it. Satan is going to tell you, you're alone, you might as well quit. God doesn't love you, but God is going with you through it. And God has a plan at the end of that situation so that you can use that as part of your life to minister to others. You get it? And when you can do that, your life will have much more meaning. So don't give up. Because we're losing too many of our young people. And I believe that's because the enemy is afraid of them. The Bible says that God has called young men because they are strong. They are strong, and young women, they're strong. I'm just saying this morning, don't die. Don't die at Heartbreak Hotel. Call on Jesus. Check into Sophia. You check in by calling out the name of Jesus if you're in a situation and you don't know what to do right now. You don't know where to go. You don't know who to speak to. All you need to do is call, call on the name of Jesus. Amen. I think we shared last time when we were here, Jason and I shared our experience with you. When we met that young man on the street that night who sexually assaulted me. And then when Jason faced him to say to him, why did you do this? He took out a pair of ladies' underwear and shook it in our faces. And then when Jason was approaching him, he took out a knife in front of him. And as I looked at Jason in between me, she'll try to shield me and this demon, because that's what it was. Uh. We need to understand we're living in a time of demonic warfare now. Yeah. Everybody ain't everybody. Yeah. And as I stood behind Jason, I knew why I was born. Because I've got a big mouth. And I had to put that in gear. But I tell you what, when he first assaulted me, I didn't use any words that we're familiar with in the Bible. I used the fleshy one, very pastor. But after that, the Holy Spirit told me, you're fighting in the flesh. And so I opened my mouth and I said, I rebuke you. I, I, did I say the name? Yes. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, sister. And let me tell you why I said he's a demon, because no ordinary human being would look at me and say, who are you rebuking? So I thought, okay, you want clarity? I said, Satan, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And then as soon as I finished that, the Holy Spirit impressed me, and I called, I checked into Sephir. I called on the name of Jesus. I said, Jesus! Yes, ladies, I didn't look too pretty that night. But it didn't matter. I called his name three times. When I called his name, the young man took the knife, pushed it in his bag, said, now that's what saved you tonight, and that's what saved me. And in back off. Telling me that's a man, or a young, young, young man. That was a demon. demon yeah. They have to have respect for the, for the name of Jesus. Amen. We have been given authority. We have been given the power. But because we don't fully understand it, we're being beaten, we're being buffeted by this enemy. Find ourselves hanging, a 
around Heartbreak Hotel. I want to do myself in. I want to quit because we do not understand the power that we have and the God that we serve. Amen. Yeah. I'm not even going to pretty up this morning. I'm done. But I'm going to ask you to think. Think about where you are right now. Are you on the way to Heartbreak Hotel? You know, mentally? Did you plan tonight that you've had enough and you're going to have to put your own plans in actions like tomorrow? I want you to think. Because we have a wonderful counsellor. We have a wonderful friend. And you have to tune into him. Yes. You have to know that he means you well. You have to know that you doesn't matter what's riding you, what's buffeting you. God still has a plan, and that plan can come to fruition. Yeah. I want us to pray. We're going to sing. We're going to invite Davina up. We're going to sing a song for you. But as we sing, please pray in your own heart about your situation. Whatever is breaking your heart, whatever the challenge is, whatever you feel is seeking to crush your spirit and to take away your hope, I want you to check into Sophia as we sing. Say to God, Lord, if you don't know what to say, just call Jesus. And after that, I would ask you to stand so that we can pray. Is that okay?
You have to take us through the crisis. You have to take us through light affliction so that our gold will come out tried in the fire. How else are we going to believe and know you and know and understand your word unless we've gone through to the other side? You never, you never promised us a rose garden as the song says. You said through great tribulation we will enter the kingdom of heaven. And it's not always welcomed and we do not always understand it and we do not like it. But even if we do not understand it, let us trust in God who says that his ways and his thoughts are higher than ours. Before we were conceived in our mother's womb, you were there. Many sperms came and they didn't hit, hit the, the egg and, 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 and it just so happened that we came about. That, mean, that means you wanted us here. Many people were aborted during pregnancy because of the enemy, but you wanted us here. We are here. And sometimes we look at our situation and we complain or the enemy makes us complain and thinking we have no right to live because we didn't come out in the right atmosphere and the right parents, etc. But in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth today, we rebuke that liar, oh God. We are trusting you. We're making a recommitment to say that we're going to stand on your word. It's not about what we feel, but it's about what your word says. And Lord, when we are feeling that all hope is gone, we know that God will make a way where there seems to be no way. We know that you're the problem solver and the way maker. So today on behalf of your children, Father, we are dumping all of our problems at the foot of the cross. We are forgetting those problems. We're pushing them behind us, Lord. We are asking you to take full control because you said if we cast our cares upon you, you care for us so you will help us to resolve them. You said do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. Amen. This morning we're coming. Some of us can't even speak. As I was in that situation, I was dumb, but thank God in your word, you said that your spirit takes our moanings and our groanings up to the Father in heaven. He's our interpreter when we cannot speak. Thank you, Lord. Father, you know the burdens. You know the trials we were talking about, women before and mothers and all the things. Lord, they are just so multi able to multitask and we are able to worry so well as well as women. But I pray, oh God, that today we will leave these problems at the foot of the cross. And instead of checking into Heartbreak Hotel, we will call out Jesus and check into Sophia in that secret place where you will water our souls and you will speak words of comfort over us. And you're not just a chatter, oh God, like some man who liked to lyrics woman and don't fulfill the word. You will fulfill your word. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Lord, put your love, extra love, extra grace, extra mercy, extra peace upon someone today. May they leave this place with hope. May they leave this place with strength. May they leave this place knowing I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and find victory today. Oh God. I would like to leave our young people into your hands as well. And in your presence, Lord, they have many things to distract them, many things going on around them. But Father God, cradle them in your bosom as the chicken. Oh God, with the chicks. We thank you that you are faithful. We thank you that you are able. We thank you that you are a God who hears and answers prayers. And we await the testimonies of those who will get over. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.